Now, Sean, many of you will have have uh, watched on our business TV conversations. He he calls a spade a bloody shovel. As pretty much all of our guys, you must have felt like you were in in with kindred spirits here. I did. I did, Alec. Indeed. Because of performance fees, you went full out on that, and you you got quite a lot of since our last conference you got quite a lot of flack on it yeah i did i think um you know it, i i just did what i th- thought was right and i felt i had to raise you know having stumbled across this i needed to make sure people understood how these things worked and if they know how it works and they really understand it and they're willing to pat that's fine and so that's all i wanted to do and um you know, it was just really an educational and lightning thing. Right? Just because I've spent a, my decade in this industry, and and there's some people who deserve those fees, and there's some people who arguably don't. And but you know, if we equipped with the knowledge, then we can make up our own minds. Yeah, and I, I think that was really very much the the case of or the point that you were trying to make was, if you are achieving ex, exceptional returns and it is a a good base against which it's measured, fantastic then it's an incentive. But it had found its way into the costing structures of some institutions, and they weren't very happy with you. No, they weren't. And um, I know for a fact, you know, there were, there were some complaints. And, um, but, you know, you can, eventually the truth comes out. And I think that's what was encouraging listening to Tim Noakes yesterday and, um, and to some of the other speakers. Eventually the truth comes out. And, you know, and so... I've moved on from that, you know, my goal is to try and make money for our clients and do good things. And that's what I'm focused on now. So, you know, that, that's, that era is behind me now. And, um, yeah. You are South African by accent. For those who don't know you, you don't live in this country. Yeah. I live in the UK in a place called Woking, which is, um, 20 minutes into London. Excuse me. Woking. Woking. I know. (laughs) Um, well positioned just south of 20 minutes from Heathrow, 20 minutes into London. Um, and, and I've been there 22 years. Apparently I still can't pronounce boutiques properly. And, and I was called up the other day, I was invited to a a boutique breakfast and we each had to invite three fund buyers in the UK. So I phoned this friend of mine who's a fund buyer and I said, um, would you like to come along to this boutique breakfast? And he said, sorry, how do I spell that? And I, I, I started spelling goes. You mean boutiques, Sean? It's boutiques. So anyway, but so, so I said, it's, I've been there twenty-two years, but I still can't uh, speak properly. Apparently, what would bring you back to South Africa? Uh, well, we look. I come back regularly. Our family are all here, other than my wife and my two children. Um, and and you know, at, we've got a place outside Cape Town. Now my children at university. I'd love to spend more time here, but I want to know that I'm safe, and I want to know that I can, you know run my computers and and be able to invest internationally, et cetera. So, and those things are achievable. I mean, they're achievable everywhere else, you know, many places else in the world. So they're, they're not insurmountable op, you know, obstacles. So for those of you who don't know, London, the greater London has got a little slice down on the southwest, and you can see it along the, the, the train line, Southwest Railways, isn't it? You don't talk Afrikaans to someone next to you thinking that you're private and you certainly do not swear in Afrikaans when you're on that line because that's little South Africa. That line that goes from Putney, Wimbledon, uh, Isha, Weybridge where Jeanette and I stayed when we were setting up in the UK and Woking is on that line as well. So it's very much part of, of little South Africa. So you're still kind of amongst our tribe. Absolutely. And I think I'm right in saying this. 300,000 South Africans. I think that's right. Um, and so there are many of us, all with family over here and, and vested interests, and we want the place to succeed. And, um, and so we just play our part. And that's the, the difference I've found with the UK and perhaps other parts of the world where South Africans live, is the UK is almost universally positive about South Africa, trying to help. How can we help? How can we send money back? What can we do? Whereas in other parts of the world, it's not, not always that case. It sometimes can be a little bit nasty. Anyway, so we love the fact that our, our mutual friend Jeff Johnson, who runs a golf day at uh, at one of the what's it is it called Burn 
Burnhill. Burnhill. Burnhill Golf Course. He runs a golf day every year uh, where he raises hundreds of thousands of pounds for South African charities. And it's heavily supported by South Africans living in the UK. And and, uh, and Sean played in that golf day this year. So there's a lot of good going on over there. And there's a lot of goodwill towards the country. My real point about talking about where you live, though, is your approach to investing, which, of course, started here, is value-based but global. And does the UK base give you an advantage? I think less of an advantage these days than previously. You know, I always sort of felt that if you were there and the Financial Times arrived in your doorstep, you were a little bit ahead. You probably aren't anymore. Um, and, and if you look at many of, you know, going back decades... The idea was that you needed an army of analysts to fly around the world and kick tires and meet management teams. These days with conference call transcripts, it's probably less needed. I mean, I think it's less needed um, and and certainly you know, less efficient. So I think the competitive advantage of where you're based now matters less. I mean, you look at Cy and their phenomenal results that um, they've managed to achieve and they do that by shorting the US. And he's reading Tesla results last night. I'm completely with him. I think Kathy Wood's delusional. So, you know, that just illustrates again that the um, that you don't have to. And you look at where we previously Orbis and they generated great returns out of Amuda. So these are global businesses these days and, and where you're positioned doesn't really matter. But maybe, Alec, just on that, I, I, I um, rebutted Magna, wrote a, a point. I think it might have been on MoneyWeb a while back um, and saying that, South African fund managers can't invest locally. And I, and I said, well, I don't think that's true. And here's why. I listed a few things. Okay. Okay. But uh, Paul Kruger and Tom Freeman are then, then right when they say the world is flat. <laughs> it's, certainly, it's certainly narrow. Well, very close. Anyway, Sean Fish from Randmore Funds, uh, who, by the way, is uh, sponsoring the wine this evening. So when you get to the gala dinner and when you drink that delicious wine, it's courtesy of, of Sean. Where did it come from? It comes from a farm called Lomond, which is near uh, Cape Agullis. And it's a friend and a client of mine. And, and I like you know, win-win relationships. And so when I was invited last time, Alec, very kindly, um, and I went on and had a look. There was a, a wine tasting the previous BNC, and I contacted Clive, and I said, have we got one this time? Because maybe I can get involved. Um, and there was, and I said, well, maybe, you know, the, this friend of mine who, who invests in our fund, being a very successful entrepreneur, supports me. I'd like to try and do something for him, support the low. And I know it was tough over COVID, you know, for these wine farmers. They couldn't. It's amazing how well they could police the movement of alcohol. You know, if we could just apply that, to some of the other problems, it would be less of a challenge. And um, and so I said, Jeff, what about, you've just won a whole lot of awards, maybe we can, you know, profile your wine. And um, and there was some, I, I think I enjoyed it a little bit too much because we were sending Jeff messages when people were coming up and thanking me at midnight. Um, and, yeah, so he woke up to a WhatsApp with a whole lot of messages from some people who'd enjoyed the Belladonna maybe too much. But anyway, I hope everybody enjoys it, and it's my little contribution to say thank you and... Uh, and to do a bit for, for something I love, which is wine and local community, etc. Thank you, Sean. The floor is now yours. So just a, a, um, well, thank you again, Alec, for the wonderful opportunity of presenting to you. And I, I've got a couple of different slides today. And, and let's start off. This might come in useful in a pub quiz. But if anybody knows what this is, given time constraints, I'm not going to ask for hands. This is the sailfish. It's the fastest fish in the sea. Okay, it weighs 55 kilograms and its top speed is 110 kilometers per hour. And when I went onto Shutterstock, because you've got to be careful about the images that you use, there weren't many great images of a sailfish. And I guess it's because you need to be a Formula One photographer underwater. Um, what have we got here? This is, the, this is the whale shark. And the whale shark weighs 19 tons and it moves at four kilometers per hour. And there are lots of photographs of whale sharks on, on Shutter, Shutterstock. So what's this? This is the Blackbird, the Lockheed Martin Blackbird. It weighs 27 tons and its top speed is 3,218 kilometers per hour. Um, and what have we got here? We've got a Lockheed Martin military transport aircraft, which weighs 172 tons. 
and it moves at less than a third of the speed, 855 kilometers per hour. So the point is, power to weight ratio matters in science and nature. Does it matter in fund management? And, and before we get into that, I want to just run through a few definitions because when you mention small cap in South African terms or, or to a UK investor or to an American investor, they often mean different things. And there's no global ca- classification which below this market cap is a small cap and above is a mid cap, etc. But what I thought I'd do in place of that is look at the MSCI World Index large, mid and small cap indices and just show you how those indexes are comprised. So the large cap index has 675 constituents. The largest market cap is $2.3 trillion, and that's Apple. And the median market cap of those 675 is 37 billion. The mid cap, the MSCI World mid cap index has 833 constituents. Largest market cap, 38 billion. The median is about 8 billion. And the small cap has 4,434 constituents. Largest market cap is 14 median market cap is one. And you can immediately see, well, hang on, how can the 14 billion not be in the large market cap? And I guess things move around. But also, if you wanted to buy a small cap ETF, you got four thousand exposure to 4,400 um, stocks out there. So the point being that 30 of the JSC top 40 companies are less than $14 billion. And on that basis, you know, including these companies, ShopRite, Nedbank, Sassel, and Sunlam. So when we talk small cap internationally, we're actually talking seriously big companies in terms of, of local side. So just with that backdrop, let me, let me move on. Now, there's a U.S. Manu- um, a fund manager called AMG, and AMG did some research in 2015, and they called it the Boutique Premium. And they studied 5,000 institutional strategies over 20 years, and they looked at the performance of boutique fund managers. Okay, and what we've got here on the um, on this this chart on the vertical axis is the annual boutique excess return, net excess return after fees, and on the x axis we've got the average rolling index returns. And this was the results of their study that that boutiques outperformed the large cap growth, large cap value, large cap core, and mid cap value growth, etc. was about was less than a percent. Okay, so the, the large company, um, b- the, the boutiques focusing on the large space are performed by less than 1%. The ones that did really well were in global equity, small cap growth, small cap value, small cap core. Okay, so, so that's quite interesting, which outperformed. Um, and so what they concluded was boutiques significantly outperform non-boutiques. And think back to those fast-moving fish and and aircraft. Does it explain and what a boutique is? It's a small fund manager, so it would be like us. It would not be if you looked at it in South African terms. You know the boutiques three six one, Counterpoint, Ranmore, um, PSG would arguably be a t- boutique. Alan Gray, Coronation, those guys would just would would not be. Okay. So then, what happened is in twenty twenty. In the UK, a business school did an analysis of European funds, 780 long-term mega funds, 20 years, and they concluded specialist boutique managers outperform their larger counterparts, especially in mid and small cap. And so you can see the same thing comes through. If you focus on boutiques that spend more time finding opportunities in the smaller and mid cap companies, you can do very well. What about South Africa? Well, we just had um, Alec mentioned the Morningstar nominations. Go and have a look at the list of of fund managers who've been nominated in Morningstar. So it's included us in the Global Equity and uh, Three Six One and Countable Merchant West in the um, local equity. But you won't see many big names. They will all be the smaller fund managers. So the question is why. And so I want to use an example of a company. And again. Yeah, caveat with the fact that I'm not going to get every stock right. Hopefully we get San Mina right, but do not go and, you know, spend all your money buying San Mina. Now, San Mina, many of you have never heard of it, and it wouldn't surprise me. I had drinks with a fund manager who is the CIO of a $20 billion fund management firm in the UK. He'd never heard of it. Okay, but what does San Mina do? They're essentially a contract manufacturer, and they specialize in mission-critical circuit boards, they make complex cables, they put together MRI machines, they put together server racks, they do all the wiring and aircrafts um, and defense. And, and importantly, they're a huge beneficiary of onshoring. Okay? 
And so we don't want to have mission critical circuit boards assembled over in Asia any longer. We want to have them assembled locally. And so when the companies then say to San Mina, can you do that? San Mina says, sure, here's the price. All of a sudden they have gone from being a price taker to a price setter. So this is a $3.6 billion company. And let's just compare this against, let's compare this um, sailfish against a whale shark. So San Mina's five-year compound growth of earnings per share was 17%. Over the last year, rolling year, they've grown 38%. In the latest quarter, they grew earnings 52%. So you can see an acceleration, okay? The forecasts for the next two years, if you use consensus estimates, are for 18%. And how much am I paying for that growth? 11 times earnings. All right, let's look at Microsoft. Compound growth, 23% over the last five years. Last year, only three. Latest quarter, minus six. And that is not dissimilar when you look at the large cap. In my interview with Alec recently, um, I mentioned that at an operating level, all the large growth, well, considered growth tech companies, operating income level fell. Okay, at earnings per share, some of them managed to buy back enough shares to sort of squeak the EPS um, over the hurdle. Uh, what do analysts think for the next two years? No, Microsoft, no, the problems behind it, it's going to start accelerating and growing again, 13%. And how much am I paying for that growth? 28 times earnings. Okay. Now, how many analysts follow San Mina? Six. Microsoft, 56. Which company is like more likely to be the undiscovered jewel? The one followed by 56 broker analysts or the one followed by six? Okay. Now let's explain. So now you've just come across San Mina. You're a big fund manager. You want to buy it. Okay. It's got a market cap of 3.6 billion. It trades about $30 million a day. If you look at the number of shares, the trade on average every day, it's about $30 million. And you want to never as a fund manager be too aggressive when you're buying. And so let's use a 10% participation level. We never get close to 10%. We try and really get the best price. So we don't get close to 10%, but let's assume you got 10% you could buy $3 million a day of San Mina. Now, if you're a $1 billion fund and you want a 3% position, that means you need $30 million position in San Mina, okay? If you're a $20 billion fund, and sometimes we compared to a large value manager in the States, which is a $67 billion fund, okay? But if you're a $20 billion fund and you want a 3% position, you need to buy $600 million worth of San Mina. Now, if San Mina only trades, if you can only buy $3 million a day, it'll take you 10 days for a $1 billion fund. It'll take you 200 days as a $20 billion fund, okay? And that's 20 day, 200 days to get in, and then 20 to 200 days to get out when you think it's at the fair price. And of course, you've got to be able to find people who, you know, want $600 million worth of San Mina at that point in time. Let's look at Microsoft. $1.9 trillion market cap, $7.8 trillion a day, 10%, 780 million, you won a 3% position, you've finished, it. you've finished buying your Microsoft before you've had your first sip of coffee, okay? Even for a $20 billion fund, you've done it while you're at the gym, okay? And so what does that mean? It means the big whale sharks stick to the likes of Microsoft. Whether or not it's the best opportunity for your money, okay? Oh, there's another problem. A $20 billion fund would own 17% of San Mina, and at 5%, you have to disclose that you've got a 5% position. So now everybody can see your hand. You're playing poker with the market, and now everyone can see your hand. So that is the problem with, um, well, it's one of the problems with trying to win big fund managers, trying to take advantage of the best opportunities. And there's a great quote, and I wish I, I tried to find, I'd read this somewhere, and I tried to find it, and all I could find out were, you know, um, Google links to Greek holidays with little coves, large ships can't visit small coves, okay? But now perhaps the boutique premium is even more relevant today because we have very high levels of market concentration. So what we've got on the vertical axis is the percentage of market cap in the world index, and what we've got on the x-axis is the percentage of companies. And if it was evenly distributed, you know, 10% of the companies would be 10% of the market cap. But that's not the case. We know that's not the case because of these big companies, all right? We don't have this. We have this where 50% of the world index market cap, okay, or value in the world index, is made up of only 8% of the companies. So huge concentration, okay? In 2013, the 10 largest companies were 10% of the index. Today, it's 17%. That is huge concentration. 
Um, but how did it get to this? And we mentioned that we've had this huge injection of capital and some of that money, that liquidity that has been injected into the markets has made its way into passives. And, and passive flows, passive assets under management have increased from $4 trillion in a few years ago. It tripled, I'm sorry, it went up two times in three years. When I started Ranmore, and it um, was 2008, less than a trillion dollars was in passives, and today $10 trillion. And you can imagine that we've all spoken, I mean, the previous two speakers, um, Sai and Pete, were both talking about how well the US has done, and everybody wants to invest by looking in the rearview mirror, and if the U.S. has done well, where do you think all this money has gone to? It's gone to the U.S. and it's perpetuated the cycle. And so today, if you invest in the Sorry, world, just explain passives. Passive funds. Index funds. You know, they're, they're not run by an active manager. It's what percentage is does Apple comprise in the world index? I think it's, um, in the S&P, it's about 7.5. I think in the world index, 85. That means for every $100 you you buy, invest in a passive, $5 goes into Apple, whether or not Apple is a great investment opportunity, okay? But what you have today is because of that, that huge amount of money moving into US companies, et cetera, you have nearly 70% of the world index is in North American companies. And go and have a look at the fund fact sheets of the funds you're invested in. You will, will not find a very different number from that in most of those fund fact sheets. In Europe, only 20%. In Japan, 10. And Magnus mentioned that they like Japan. We love Japan. I mean, we've got as much in Japan as we have in U.S. equities. And But back in 1998, I think it was, uh, sorry, 88, Japan was 40% of the world index and the U.S. was far lower. And then you had the Japanese collapse and it all collapsed in, in tears. But Japan is an amazing place. Um, and and we love those companies. And, uh, and, and so who are quite heavily invested. Now, so what does that mean? It means today, most people are invested the same way. And they're in passives, they're in US, they're in large cap and they're in growth. And they're underweight actives, XUS, mid, mid or small cap and value. Okay. And this seesaw is upside down, but just imagine, you know, when people start to shift and they will shift, the passives won't shift first, it'll be the aggressive hedge funds that all of a sudden you know, will start shorting U.S. companies, et cetera. Um, they will start shifting, and and you just need a little bit of money to start moving from the U.S. to Europe and to Japan because those places, Europe and Japan, are not as liquid in the U.S. It's much easier to sell $10 million of J.P. Morgan than it is to buy $10 million of Deutsche Bank. Yeah, You won't move the price of J.P. Morgan. You'll definitely move the price of Deutsche Bank. Um, the problem now is growth is shrinking. So everybody's been watching interest rates. What's going to happen to interest rates? What's going to happen to inflation? We've seen inflation stay stubbornly high, notwithstanding the fall in many of these commodity prices. But now the real truth is coming home, and that is that growth is shrinking. And you heard what Sai had to say about Tesla's results, and that's exactly what is happening. Okay, And, and just how overinflated Tesla is, and that's why I think Tesla could halve. So... The world has turned upside down. The last three years, the world's turned upside down. Think about it from, from COVID. We've gone from low inflation to high inflation, low interest rates to rising interest rates, offshoring to onshoring, stability to instability. Okay. If the world has turned upside down, why don't the mega funds reposition? Because they can't. This is that container vessel they're given stuck in the Suez Canal. They can't reposition. How do they sell $6 trillion dollars of Apple and all that, and invest that in sand meters. There's not enough sand meters for that, okay? But but active managed boutiques can. And here's our weightings. We less than twenty percent. Sorry, twenty percent in in the U.S., just forty seven percent in Europe, um, twenty percent in Asia. But in emerging markets, that's Petrobras. Um, and uh, and so we've been able to do that, and we've been able to move around the world wherever we find the best opportunities. And so performance-wise, $100 invested in our fund when we started is worth nearly $400 today. And we, in the top percentile over one, two years, second percentile over three years, and third percentile since inception. And that is in a period, now if you stand back and you look at it and you go, well, but Sean, what about a recession? Well, you know, over that period, you've had US recession, European financial crisis, pandemic, et cetera. Don't worry about that. We can move and find the opportunities wherever they are around the world. And in RANDs, just to put that into perspective with, with RANDs, 
a hundred dollars is seven hundred and eighty rand. A hundred rand at conception is now seven hundred and eighty rand. That's fifteen percent compounded per annum. Yeah, meaningfully ahead of our large peers. And you can see the purple line at the bottom is, you know, the the, the large competitors, and they lag the index because they can't they can't move. So, in an ever changing world, how do you want your money invested? In the barges or the speedboats? Thank you.